is hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this session, uh, and it is uh, my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, the, the current uh, invited speaker, Patrice Osona de Mendes. Uh, apart from uh, many other important contributions to graph theory and combinatorics, Patrice, uh, together also with uh, Yaroslav Neshetshil, uh, has created the theory of uh, sparse uh, graph uh, classes. Uh, this theory has uh, revolutionized uh, finite model theory and its uh, connections with, uh, with computer science and has been an intense uh, topic of study in the last uh, few years uh, with many deep and beautiful results uh, which combine graph theory, combinatorics uh, and logic. And uh, well, today I guess we'll hear a little bit about this but also about uh, uh, new directions which involve uh, dense uh, classes. So it, I'm looking very much looking forward to hear this talk and I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, so nice introduction and for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. So let me share my screen. Okay. So today, I would like to speak about uh, first order transductions of graphs. So, which is a topic which is a uh, kind of bridge between uh, uh, graph theory and uh, model theory. Uh, may, most of the works that I will present here will be uh, our joint work with uh, Edouard Bonnet, Jakub Gajarski, Hugo Jokanti, Yitin Yang, Yarik Nezetril. Michał Pilipczuk, Rom, uh, Roman Rabinovich, Stefan Tomasz, Ste Sebastian Sibert, and Shimon Turucic. I hope I did not forget anyone. Um, so, what is, what is the idea? So, the main idea here is, uh, is to, uh, to have a framework to study, some, uh, to study classes of, of graphs, infinite classes of graphs. So this will be the, uh, the beasts that uh, we want to study. And, uh, but there are, there are many uh, such uh, uh, strange uh, classes. And uh, before looking at some uh, more, more closely, maybe we want to have a kind of taxonomy to, to be able to, to have some category of uh, some classes which are more easy, some which are more difficult, and uh, some which are so difficult that uh, we don't even want to speak about it. So here are the, to start, somehow the, the standard and the well-known, uh, well-studied ones. Uh, I mean, uh, for instance, uh, the class of planar graphs, uh, the class of uh, graphs embeddable on the surface, or even the class of minor clo uh, classes, uh, minor close classes, or classes which exclude a minor, uh, which have been popularized and uh, and uh, deeply studied by uh, Robertson and Seymour, and for which we know many things. Uh, topologically, topologically minor closed classes, so classes which exclude some uh, topological minor for which uh, some things are known, and, uh, but uh, uh, there are some limits to, uh, more limits to what is known. Uh, and more generally, monotone classes, which mean classes which are closed by taking a subgraph, and hereditary classes, uh, which means uh, classes which are closed under taking induced subgraphs. Okay, so in some sense, as you can see in this nice picture, the holy grail will be already hereditary classes, which uh, look more, uh, uh, which looks nicer. So the first, the first point here will be to start from uh, minor closed classes, which are uh, well known, and, uh, and to go to the direction of monotone classes to see at what time for which type of classes uh, we, um, we somehow have uh, some uh, qualitative jump in the structural properties. And uh, this, in some sense, will, it will be a witness for, uh, for some uh, sparsity result. If we are minor closed, uh, a minor closed class will be considered as sparse. But uh, of course, the class of all graphs, which is monotone, is, uh, is not a sparse class. It's, uh, it contains things which are very difficult. And, uh, and, there, are, and there are some, uh, some jump in the structural, uh, on the structural properties that you can find in, 
in, uh, in planar graphs and in general graphs. So for instance, if we simply look at the number of edges that you can have in a, in a graph in a class which excludes a minor, then we know that uh, the, uh, this uh, number of edges has to be uh, is bounded by a linear function of the number of vertices. And, uh, and this is also true in a more general setting where you exclude a topological minor. So maybe in some sense, having uh, some uh, bonded average degree could be some, uh, some good indication. So let's go to the opposite. Let's start from, uh, from, so we have a monotone class and we start to exclude something. If we exclude any subgraphs that we know, uh, that the number of edges is bounded by uh, uh, basically a bit less than n square of uh, n choose two edges. And uh, the factor depends only on the chromatic number of what we have uh, excluded. This is the celebrated Erdos Simonovitz Stone theorem. But uh, still, the number of edges is quadratic, except when uh, maybe when H is bipartite. So, what happens if you exclude some, uh, some click, some by click? Sorry. If you exclude some by clicks, then uh, the number of edges is uh, suddenly a bit more constrained. And uh, instead of n square, uh, it is something like n to 2 minus 1 over t, where uh, uh, t is uh, the size of the parts in the bipartite, uh, in the bipartite graph that uh, we excluded. And we can go even further if we exclude a two, the 2m two subdivision of some graph, then uh, the number of, uh, of edges now is, uh, is just a little more than n. That linear, it's, a, it's bounded by n plus uh, n to one plus something which goes to zero when the number of subdivision vertices goes to infinity. So it gives a feeling that uh, there will be something which can be related to excluding uh, subdivisions. And okay, let's uh, let's uh, we, we shall start from this point and uh, to define what we mean by uh, sparse classes. We say that, uh, we say that the class is uh, nowhere dense if, uh, if we exclude the piece subdivision of some graph. You can uh, think uh, without loss of generality, you exclude the piece subdivision of a clique. So for every P, there exists some clique, some NP, N sub P, such that you exclude the piece subdivision of K N sub P. And uh, so the click, the subdivided clicks that you will exclude uh, as a size which can depend on P. So the more subdivision points you have, maybe the larger the click, uh, the P subdivided clicks that you will exclude. And uh, a class will have bounded expansion. It will be a, a bit more restricted if not only for each uh, integer P, we exclude the P subdivision of some graph, but actually we exclude the piece subdivision of all graphs which have large minimum degree. And by large minimum degree, which mean a minimum degree, which is at least some F of P, where F is some, uh, is some, some function of P. Can be any, any function. So just to give an example, if we consider any topologically minor closed class, of course, uh, it has bounded expansion because uh, you will exclude uh, if you have uh, if you exclude some uh, uh, some topological minor, then every topo uh, every graph which appears as a piece subdivision in my class has bounded uh, as bounded uh, average degree, so cannot have a minimum degree which is too big. So. In the, clay, in the case of a class which excludes a topological minor, my function f of p is actually, uh, I can choose it to be a constant. And to give an example of a nowhere dense class which does not have bounded expansion, uh, consider for instance, a class of graphs such that, uh, let's say that the maximum degree is less or equal than the girls. Then, if you if you're in your class, you can find the piece subdivision of a clique. It means 
that in your graph, you have a cycle of lengths, basically 3p. But if you have a, length, a cycle of length 3p, then the maximum degree is also 3p. So it means that your complete graph cannot have more than 3p vertices. So for every p, you exclude the p subdivision of a complete graph with uh, 3p plus uh, two or three uh, vertices. So this class is nowhere there. So these classes uh, correspond to uh, what, we, what we call sparse classes, and they have many nice properties, uh, nice uh, decomposition uh, uh, properties, and, uh, and nice algorithmic properties. And, uh, and here, because we will be interested in connection with first order logic, let us mention, for instance, that first order model checking for these classes is fixed parameter tractable, as proved by Dvojak, Carl, Thomas for bonded expansion classes, and uh, Groh, Kreutzer, and Siebert for nowhere dense. So let me say what I mean by FO model checking and what I mean by FPT here. Uh, by FO model checking, I, I simply mean that if I consider any sentence, so it's a formula without any free variable uh, in first order logic. Uh, so my formula can say that uh, some vertex is adjacent to another vertex uh, is equal to another vertex. I can use conjunction, disjunction, negation, and quantification of our vertices. And this way I construct a sentence. They want to check whether my graph satisfies this sentence or not. And if my class is nowhere dense, uh, I can check that the sentence is satisfied by the graph in my class in time um, some function of my formula time the size of the graph to one plus epsilon, where epsilon is any uh, positive uh, real value. So it's almost linear time. Uh, to the opposite, if I have a monotone class, which is uh, not nowhere dense, Actually, this F, uh, FO model checking is not FPT under some uh, standard assumption, which means that uh, I cannot find uh, under the standard assumptions uh, an algorithm which would run in time F of the formula time the size of the graph to some fixed power, say n to 100. OK, so we see that already we have some, uh, uh, some, um, some jump in the algorithmic properties. Uh, I will not say too much about the structural properties, but there are many jumps. And, uh, and from, from this uh, change, the strong change in the structural property uh, follow many characterizations of uh, nowhere dense and bonded expansion classes. Okay, so now let's look at our graal, which is, uh, which are the proper hereditary classes. What we would like is to uh, to have some idea of what could be uh, a tame or easy proper hereditary class when it is possible to to say something. So let's look at first at uh, at some basic properties. So a first property, which is well known, is that in every graph, you can find an homogeneous subset, which means a clique or a stable set or independent set of size roughly log n, where n is the number of vertices. But it has been conjectured by Erdős and Einal that if you forbid any induced copy of, a given, of any given graph f, then actually you can find an homogeneous subset of size not only log n, but n to some epsilon, where the epsilon only depend on the, uh, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the graph f that you have uh, forbidden as an induced subgraph. OK, so this gives some, uh, some intuition that uh, uh, forbidding something. So if you take a proper hereditary class, which is not the class of all graphs, then already you have some, some nice property. But uh, maybe uh, these properties are, are not sufficiently strong and uh, witnessed by the fact that uh, this is still a co this Erdős Einal conjecture is still a conjecture. So maybe we can look at some examples where we can exclude things 
that make our life really, really easier. And, uh, and actually, the, uh, the best, maybe the, the easiest case correspond to the case where you forbid an induced complete bipartite graph. So, or even when you exclude a complete bipartite graph as a subgraph. So excluding a complete bipartite graph as a subgraph is the same as excluding an induced complete bipartite and excluding also a, a, a click by some Ramsey argument. And uh, here is an example uh, why excluding a complete bipartite graph as a subgraph uh, suddenly makes your life easier. And uh, this is a theorem by uh, Zdeniek Wojak, which says that if you exclude a bi-click as a subgraph, then if a graph contains some D subdivision, where D is, uh, is, uh, uh, is any fixed integer of a graph with very large minimum degree, then actually your graph contains some induced K subdivision where K is some uh, integer less or equal than D of a graph which still has some large minimum degree. It is much smaller minimum degree, but it is still, uh, it can be still uh, chosen large. So it means if you can find a subdivision of a graph with large minimum degree, you have also a large induced subdivision of a large with large minimum degree. And from this, it follows that uh, you can have some characterization of nowhere dense classes and bonded expansion classes by saying first, you exclude a by click as a subgraph. And then instead of saying that you exclude for every P, the P subdivision of some graph as a subgraph, it's sufficient to exclude the piece of division of some graph as an induced subgraph. So in some sense, to say it uh, in a very intuitive way, if you have a hereditary class of graphs and you exclude a bi-click as a subgraph, suddenly, more or less, your class becomes sparse. Or at least it, it, uh, it, it looks like a monotone class. It has uh, many properties that, uh, that you like in monotone classes. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's leave the, the this graph theory point of view and look at the other side, which is model theory point of view. So uh, for those who are not familiar with model theory, uh, Model theory is interested in formulas, in set of formulas, and, uh, and possibly in, uh, in the structures that satisfy these formulas. Whether, uh, so in, uh, in graph theory, we are interested in graphs and possibly in formulas which are satisfied with the graph. So it's kind of dual point of view. Uh, in, uh, in one side, we look more at, uh, at structures, vertices of the graph, edges of the graph, and then the properties. On the other hand, uh, in model theory, we are more interested in the properties and then on the graphs that satisfy these properties. It's a kind of. Uh... And in model theory, uh, some, uh, some very strong dividing lines have appeared uh, in, the, in the Western study, in particular by, uh, by Scheller. And, uh, and these this dividing lines, the main dividing lines, are called stability and dependence. So what is this? So I, I will somehow adapt the definition, the standard definition to our case. So we have a class of graphs, C, and I will say that a formula, phi of x, y. So remember, uh, this is a formula uh, where I can use uh, adjacency, uh, conjunction, disjunction, negation, and uh, equality and um, quantification over vertices. And here my formula has uh, two tuples of vertices of uh, three variables, uh, two tuples of three variables x and y. And my formula is called independent on my class. If for every n, I can find a graph in my class and I can find two, two uh, um, sequence of tuples ai and bj such that in my graph, the formula phi will be satisfied 
when x is replaced by ai and y is replaced by bj if and only if the index i is included in the set j. So ai is indexed by elements of uh, uh, indices value between one and n, and uh, bj is indexed by subsets of, uh, of the set one, one to n. So a schematic point of view is to say that in my graph G, I can find my tuples A1, A2, A3, my, uh, my tuples B empty set up to B1 uh, to 3. And if I draw a line uh, between some AI and some BJ, when uh, my formula is satisfied in my graph for uh, AI and BJ, then I will get this kind of graphs which is kind of a universal bipartite graph or, or power graph. Uh, it, uh, we can give it uh, many names. And if my formula is not independent, I will say that it is dependent. So uh, arguably this is not a, an easy definition, but uh, we will not use it uh, with uh, all these, uh, uh, these subtleties and uh, all the stoppers, but uh, uh, I had to say, uh, I will give some, uh, some examples of this. The first example is uh, when this formula phi of xy is simply the adjacency relation. So x is simply one free variable, y is one free variable, and the formula phi is simply x is adjacent to y. So what does it mean? It means that uh, I want to find this graph here as a semi-induced subgraph. Semi-induced means that between these vertices A1, A2, A3, I don't know if there are edges, between these vertices I, uh, B, B something, I don't know if there are edges, but between the two, the AIs and the BJ, I want to have exactly the edges which are depicted, depicted here, which means A small i is adjacent to B, uh, big J, if and only if i is, in, in, is included in J. So a way to say it is that a class has a dependent edge relation, edge relation if and only if the graph in the class excludes some bipartite graph as an induced subgraph. If you exclude something, you cannot have what I have shown uh, previously for any integer n, because these graphs are kind of universal. For sufficiently big n, one of these graphs will contain the bipartite graph you choose. And uh, okay, so this is our first definition. And uh, I would say that my class is dependent more generally, if not only with edge relation, but every formula is dependent. And it, my class is monadically dependent if even if I use colors on my vertices and I can use the colors in my formula, uh, this class of colored graphs is still dependent. Okay, it's, uh, it's a bit technical, but, uh, but already this property uh, has many impacts and uh, has connection with some, uh, some notions that I, I will not go into details, but uh, for instance, uh, this the notion of dependent edge relation is uh, basically uh, related to the notion of VC dimension. If you look at uh, having a dependent edge relation means that if you look at the neighborhood, the family of the neighborhood of your vertices, then this family of sets has bonded VC dimension. It is if and only if. So it's something that you will find, uh, will uh, uh, meet in uh, when you do some uh, uh, pack learning or whatever. Anyway, now the notion of stability. The notion of stability, it's okay, its definition looks very similar. The, the main difference is what you exclude. Independence uh, for independent uh, formula, what, uh, what, you, you, what I said is that you can find uh, tuples AI and tuples BJ such that the formula phi AI BJ is satisfied if and only if I belongs to J. And here you will find two uh, two sequences a i and b j both indexed by integers between one and n, and the formula phi of a i b j will be satisfied if and only if i is less or equal than j. 
So it means that if you look at the pairs A, I, B, J for which uh, the formula is satisfied, you will get a half graph. And if a formula is not unstable, then it is stable. So a formula is stable if uh, basically you cannot construct arbitrary long half graph with using the formula. And again, if you consider only uh, the adjacency relation, then you'll say that uh, the class has a stable edge relation if uh, the uh, adjacency relation is stable, which means that the graphs in the class exclude some half graph as a semi-induced subgraph. So from now you have some intuition of what happens from graph theoretical point of view. A class is stable if every formula is stable and it is monadically stable if whatever coloration you would use, even with, uh, with uh, colors on the vertices and colors uh, used in the formula, your, uh, your class would remain stable. So in what does it help? What does it, uh, what does it change if you ask that the class is dependent or stable? Uh, the first, Let's look at our uh, erdosh einal conjecture. The first point is that if your class has a dependent edge relation, or equivalently, if it has a bounded VC dimension, then uh, you, can, you can find homogeneous subsets which are much larger than log n. Actually, you have, uh, you have uh, a quasi-polynomial lower bound. And this has been proved by Fox, Parr, and Souk. And, uh, and if you if you constrain more, and not only you ask that you have a dependent edge relation, but you, have, you ask that you have a stable edge relation, then actually you can prove that you can find some uh, homogeneous subset of uh, polynomial size, n to delta, where delta basically depends on the half graphs uh, that cannot appear as a semi-induced subgraph. Um, just one, one remark at this point, that uh, these two theorems rely on, uh, on special form of semi-read irregularity lemma uh, for, uh, for the case of graph with dependent edge relation and for graph with stable edge relations. And in both cases, the number of parts in this uh, special form of the semi-read uh, regularity lemma, the number of parts is, uh, is polynomial in uh, one over epsilon, which is uh, already some uh, very strong property. Okay, so we see that this, uh, this dividing lines, uh, even if, uh, if they still seem a bit cryptic by uh, using this formula in full generality, may have some connection with graph theory and with the study of hereditary classes in the sense that uh, uh, they correspond to cases where you, we can say something. So it looks like something reasonable. And, uh, and now it's, uh, there is something which also uh, uh, makes this notion interesting is what happens when you start from one of these nice classes and you also exclude the by click as a subgraph, which means when you look at the sparse version. And then it is strange that if you consider a monadically dependent class, a class is monadically uh, a class which excludes the by click is monadically dependent if and only if it is nowhere dense. And actually, when you exclude a bi-click as a subgraph, monadically dependent and monadically stable correspond to the same notion. There is a collapse, which looks strange. In general, it is not the case for hereditary classes, but excluding a bi-click is something very strong, excluding a bi-click as a subgraph. If you exclude a bi-click, then a class has bonded three widths if and only if it has bonded three widths. So again, we have two notions that we already have uh, heard about. And, uh, and we see that excluding a bi-click, which somehow means I look at the sparse analog. Um, okay, there is a nice, nice collapse. If you, your class has bonded linear click widths, if and only if it has bonded pass widths. So we see that, uh, so the, in some sense, the sparse analog of linear click widths is uh, something which is uh, already uh, well known. And, uh, and the notion of shrub depths and tree depths, which are a bit less known, maybe uh, also collapse. 
Um, I will say a bit more about this, uh, this last thing uh, uh, later on. Okay, so from all of this, it means that uh, uh, there are good reasons to say that uh, uh, we want to start from classes which are monadically dependent. Monadically dependent is somehow uh, one of, uh, uh, of the weakest restrictions that we mentioned from a model theoretical point of view, which means that whatever coloring you would put on the vertices, you would be dependent. And uh, already it will imply some nice uh, properties. So let's uh, add a strict structure to these beasts. And we look at this, this ocean. And this ocean, you will see some, uh, that somehow uh, it will be uh, more or less deep, depending on what you look at. And there will be, on the top, there will be a small region where we, OK, we basically know what happens. But it is very small. Then you have uh, the twilight zone, where we have some idea of what happens. And then you have the midnight zone, where um, we, 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 not, we, we are not even sure of what conjecture we should have. And, uh, and on the other end, we can go from the shore to the offshore. On the shore, we will have uh, classes which are very simple, like uh, tree depths and shrub depths, then pass widths and linear click widths, then classes with bonded tree widths and bonded click widths, then classes with bonded expansions and nowhere dense. And then you have, so all this top here will be all the things that exclude a bi-click as a subgraph. So I have this kind of bi-click line where the things are quite easy. I am kind of sparse. And then when I go to the other side, then there is some regime when I am monadically stable. It looks still reasonably, uh, reasonably uh, um, easy. And then I go to something which is uh, not monadically stable, but still uh, uh, monadically dependent. And uh, on, uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom right, I have the abyss of uh, all the, uh, the crazy conjectures that you could have about this uh, monadically dependent classes. So now we have some ideas at, uh, at the landscape where we could, uh, uh, where we will dive. And uh, now let's look at the tools <coughs> that we can use. And the tools will be twofold, interpretations and transductions. So interpretation is a very basic tool in, uh, in model theory. And basically a graph or structure H is an interpretation of a structure G Think about graph, uh, graph H is an interpretation of a graph G, is everything that you can define by a formula in H can be defined by a formula in G. For instance, the vertex set of H, okay, of, obviously you can define by a formula. Uh, this is a set of all X, uh, of all vertices. Then it has to be some definable set in, in G. So it is a set of tuples of vertices which satisfy some formula. So I wrote on the right some, uh, uh, some formal definition, but you, you should not have a look at it uh, too much because we will not be interested here in interpretation in their full generality. We will be interested in interpretations uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, rest uh, okay, in the more restricted cases. And the first restriction is that we simply have some uh, formula to say, uh, what are the vertices where we want uh, the vertices of uh, H and what uh, some formula would, that would tell us when two vertices of H are adjacent. And you can check that uh, basically it is all what we need to define F, uh, H from G. So we have these two formulas, uh, rho V and rho E, and uh, you start from a graph G and then now you define a new graph H by this interpretation. You say, okay, the vertices of H are all the tuples X uh, or tuples of vertices which satisfy rho V and, uh, and the edges are all the pairs of, uh, of tuples X and Y uh, which satisfy rho E uh, in, in G. Let me give some examples. Okay, first example. 
So let's say that uh, every that my uh, my vertices of H are the same as the vertices of G. So my formula is uh, uh, rho G uh, takes only one free variable, and my formula is simply true. So every vertex of G is a vertex of H. And for the adjacency, I would say, okay, two vertices are adjacent if they are not equal and they are not adjacent in G. This is my formula on top. And this way, I construct the complement graph. Okay, easy, easy version. I can do something a bit more complex. I can look at the square. So the square basically means that two vertices in H, so the vertices in H are the same as the vertices in G, and two vertices in H will be adjacent if they are distance at most two in G, but I can express by some formula where I use some existential quantifier. Okay, but uh, here I have only used uh, single free variables. What happens if I use uh, tuples? Uh, things, crazy things can happen. For instance, uh, if I use tuple, if I use pairs from an edgeless graph, I can interpret a two subdivided click. So you see that uh, uh, in some sense, uh, this what happens uh, looks not that uh, that nice. Uh, especially if we, if we would like to close uh, under induced subgraphs, it means that I would be able uh, that uh, if I would close my uh, two subdivided ticks by induced subgraphs, then I would have all two subdivided graphs. And from structural or algorithmic properties, uh, two subdivided uh, graphs are the same as graphs in full generality. So it explains why actually I don't like tuples. So I will restrict myself to interpretations where I will only use single free variables, not tuples. But I will allow to use colors. So this is the meaning of a transduction. So if you want to construct a graph H from a graph G by transduction, you color, you put some colors, and then you interpret using a formula that can use the colors. Or if you prefer, you can see it the other way. You can say that the graph H can be encoded in the graph a a G if you can put some colors in the graph G such that when you apply the formula, you get your graph H back. So that somehow you have a, a fixed interpretation that uses colors. Your graph G has no colors, but you can put the colors in the vertices in such a way that you will recover your graph H. So the strength of the transduction is that you color, but you are not all allowed to, to take any powers. You are not allowed to take tuples. Uh, sometimes you can allow uh, to, to, uh, to blow vertices into a bounded number of vertices, but it is a technicality, and I will not go into these details. OK. So let's look at, uh, oh, I am, I am kind of slow. <laughs> so let's look at uh, some, uh, uh, some examples. So uh, this is definition. So we say that uh, a graph uh, is, uh, is transduction of another, okay, uh, basically, if it can be obtained by coloring and transduction and interpretation. And then a class is transduction of another if every graph in my, uh, in my target class uh, can be obtained by, uh, trans by coloring some graph in my source class and then applying the interpretation. So examples. If I start from edgeless graphs, what can I get? I can color my vertices and then apply a transduction. And then you can, uh, you can uh, figure out that uh, basically you cannot obtain more than a blowing of a fixed graph. Basically, the adjacency will be determined only by the colors. So it's a kind of a boring class. If you start with a class of trees with bonded height, what you get is, uh, and we could use it as a, body, a definition, uh, are classes with bonded shrub depths. So a class has bonded shrub depths if and only if it is a transduction of a class of trees with bonded height. From unit interval graphs, 
Uh, actually, for instance, by transduction, you can get uh, all half graphs, but you cannot get all graphs. And uh, and there is some nice uh, uh, some nice connection to to, to connect to uh, some uh, standard uh, uh, thing from graph theory that uh, uh, already you can characterize, for instance, classes with bonded rank widths exactly as the classes that you can obtain by transduction from the class of co graphs. And the class of, of graph with bonded linear rank widths are exactly the classes that are transduction of the class of half graphs. So you see that somehow it is, there is some meaning. So here to show you that from interval graphs, you could get everything. I will not go into the details because I am already late. And, and now something which makes things uh, a bit easier you, when you use transduction is that the class is modelically dependent if and only if by transduction you cannot obtain all graphs. And it is monadically stable if and only if you cannot, by transduction, you cannot obtain all half graphs. So it means that uh, in the definition that I gave uh, before, I use formula with, uh, with tuples of three variables, but actually in the monadic case, for monadically dependence or monadically stable, you don't care. You don't need tuples. Transduction are okay. And also, if you have a class which is monadically dependent and you, and you ask yourself whether it is monadically stable, then you don't even have to look at any formula. A monadically dependent class is monadically stable if and only if it excludes some semi-induced half graph. So, uh, which means that you only have to check that, it is, uh, that the edge relation is stable. So it means that uh, uh, there is kind of uh, uh, graph theoretical uh, view of as difficult model theoretical uh, notions. So now in the in the remaining uh, quarter of hour, I have to, uh, to to go fast. Let me have a look at uh, the beast I can find in the shore, which is this this uh, completely to the left. This bay, which is somehow the thing which are still uh, possible to handle, and when I go offshore, in the shore, <clears throat> I found I find bonded eye trees. Basically, this is tree depths and shrub depths, and on bonded eye trees, things are easy. Uh, why things are easy? Because first order transduction is, uh, using first order logic or second order logic. Uh, is the same. So even uh, uh, you, uh, you have so many nice properties that uh, actually uh, uh, the, uh, the study of this, uh, of this object uh, is, um, is kind of easy. When I say kind of easy, it is not completely true because for instance, you can prove that if a class is as bonded shrub depths, so remember a class as bonded shrub depths means that it is transduction of a class of bonded eye trees, then you cannot have a transduction to the class of all paths. So to say it uh, otherwise, you don't have any transduction from bonded eye trees, a class of bonded eye trees to the class of all paths. And it is conjectured that actually this is kind of characterization. If a class does not have a transduction to the class of all paths, then it is a transduction of the class of uh, bonded eye trees. But uh, this conjecture is still uh, widely open. So even for shrub depths, uh, this is uh, this is there are still some conjecture which are uh, which are left and uh, which are not so easy. And when you exclude exclude a by click on this uh, bonded shrub depths classes, you have a uh, classes with bonded three depths and uh, which are uh, minor close classes. And, uh, and these classes are very simple. A class has bonded three depths if it excludes some paths as a subgraph or as a minor, it is equivalent. They have uh, many nice properties and there are the building blocks of classes with bonded expansion, but uh, I will not say much about them. So this is for the shore. Let's go to the bay. So the bay is still correspond to classes which are still uh, nice, but uh, a bit more complex. So 
In particular, you have uh, classes with bonded linear uh, click widths or classes with bonded click widths. And, uh, and something which is nice is that if you have a class which is stable and which has bonded click widths, for instance, then actually a stable class with bonded click widths is the same as a transduction of a class with bonded tree widths. A class which is stable and has bonded linear click widths is the same as a transduction of a class with bonded pass widths. So it looks it looks strange, but uh, we, we will see in uh, uh, you can see that in this uh, in this picture. Uh, sorry. Here, that it means that in this uh, in this uh, intermediate blue, what we have in this intermediate blue are transduction of classes with bonded pass widths, and here. Uh, close to it, it's a transduction of class with bonded tree width. We know exactly what it is. And we can go further and uh, in this bay. And if we want to go further, we have to, uh, we have to introduce the notion of twin widths, which is a notion which has been introduced by uh, uh, Bonnet, uh, Bonnet uh, uh, Thomas, uh, Kim, Vatrigan, and others. I, I will forget many, uh, sorry. And it goes by using the notion of contraction sequence. You have a graph, and in the graph, you, you have, uh, consider a graph where you, your edges can be red or black. So in the beginning, you, you have a real graph, so all the edges are black. You take any ver two vertices, you take two vertices and you identify. And when you identify, all the edges which are black and go to common black neighbors will be black. All the other edges that, uh, that, that remain, so that, uh, for instance, went to, to some private neighbor or were, uh, was red, will become red. So in some sense, you can look at uh, red as some accumulated errors when you try to identify two vertices. So how far are them from being clones? So they are not clones. And, uh, and the, uh, the reason why they are not clothes are these red edges and these red edges accumulate when you do contraction and again and again. So when you have a graph G, the twin width of G is a, maxi is a minimum D so that you can contract these vertices two by two uh, in a sequence ending with a one single, uh, a single vertex graph. And at each time, the maximum red degree is at most D. And uh, these classes include, in particular, classes with bonded sequence. So they are kind of nice. Uh, it's nice uh, generalization. But for, on these classes, first order model checking is fixed parameter tractable. So these are really nice from al algorithmic point of view. In some sense, it has, uh, they are kind of orthogonal to this direction of nowhere dense. And, uh, if you exclude some by click, which uh, we use as a, as a standard way to see uh, what means the sparse, what is the sparse meaning of it, then uh, what you get as bonded expansion. It is not all bonded expansion. It, is not, it does not even include all uh, classes uh, with bonded degree, even not the class of cubic graphs, but uh, it includes all proper minor closed classes of graphs. And, uh, and they have nice properties. For instance, if you have bonded twin widths, you are kite bonded, which extends some properties which were known for bonded click widths. Okay, I have to go a bit faster. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and now some, uh, some nice characterization of twin widths. So we have seen that twin widths was, was somehow defined using some really uh, graph theoretical point of view. You, uh, you make these contractions and you, are, you look at the uh, uh, maximum red degree and you look at the minimum uh, possible maximum red degree uh, when you look at all possible sequences. But you can also look at it in an, uh, by, the, by the point of view of model theory and you can prove that a class has only twin widths if and only if actually you, there exists a class of ordered graphs so there is a way to put linear orders on your graphs, such that with these linear orders, the class of ordered graphs is dependent, and your class is simply uh, so obtained by forgetting these linear orders. So it is a very uh, clean notion 
from the model theoretical point of view. It means basically this is a this is tractable class of ordered graphs. It is, uh, and in this case, actually, um, dependent or monadically dependent are equivalent. And also, you can look at it from a more constructive way and say that a class has bonded twin weeks if and only if it is a transduction of, uh, of a proper permutation class. So of a permutation class, uh, so a class of permutation where permutations are uh, presented by the mean of two linear orders on the same set. And uh, proper means that you exclude some, uh, some pattern. So it is related to this uh, uh, Stanley Wilf conjecture with properties or Marcus uh, uh, Tardosh uh, properties. And uh, in this way, using this, uh, this permutation classes, you can even define what does it mean for a class who have bonded linear rank widths or to have bonded rank widths. For instance, a class of bonded rank widths, if and only if it is a transduction of a class of permutations, of the class of permutations that avoid the pattern two, three, one. So this is strange. Uh, now you have this transduction, which makes connection between some graph theoretical notion of rank widths and, uh, and the permutation classes. But uh, you can also use it to, uh, to study uh, hereditary class of ordered graphs and prove that uh, actually, uh, if, you have, uh, if you look at graphs which already have a linear order, then uh, hereditary class has bonded twin width, if and only if it does not include some of the uh, some basic classes and you have only a bonded number of them, few of them, and uh, it allowed us to prove uh, uh, that uh, to solve some, uh, some old conjecture of Bullock, Bolobash, and Morris to show that uh, if you have a hereditary class of ordered graphs, then you have some jump in the speed of, uh, of the class. Okay, I will, uh, I will go a bit faster. So now we have that in the bay. So we see that the bay basically is this bonded uh, twin width. It means that if you have a linear, if you can put a linear order and be monadically dependent, then you are in this bay. And in this bay, you have nice properties. Uh, first order model checking is fixed parameter tractable, and you have uh, uh, you don't have too many uh, induced subgraph of size n. You have uh, chi bonded. Uh, you have many properties. And offshore, offshore, uh, you simply uh, uh, find bonded expansion classes which are still nice. Uh, transduction of bonded expansion classes for which we have still some ideas of what is going on, but uh, still if, uh, model checking is not completely clear. It's a, uh, model checking is fixed parameter tractable modulo, uh, the possibility to compute some decomposition uh, in polynomial time or having them given uh, with, uh, together with a graph. And the graph are linearly kite bonded, so we have still some kite boundedness properties. But when you go to the nowhere dance and try to uh, generalize nowhere dance, then things become really wild. First, because nowhere dance classes are not high bonded and uh, you don't have nice logical properties like uh, quantifier elimination. And, uh, but uh, still, you know that you have some nice properties that uh, FO model checking is FPT for nowhere dance. So there is some hope that it could be extended to some denser version. And also, what is nice with nowhere dense is that there is some uh, model theoretical characterization of nowhere dense. A monotone class of graph is nowhere dense if and only if it is dependent or equivalently monadically dependent or equivalently stable or equivalently monadically stable. So for monotone, for monotone classes, so when a class is closed under subgraphs, it is something strange uh, uh, appears that all this uh, model theoretical notion collapse. And they collapse to the notion of no denseness. So, which seems to be uh, uh, a reasonable threshold for the notion of sparsity. And, and we have a very brief conjecture that actually every monadically stable class is a transduction of a no dense class. So, to conclude, here is what our 
monadically dependent ocean look like. On the left, we have uh, uh, we have a part. So we we have a part where uh, uh, not only first order model checking, but uh, monadic second order model checking is fixed parameter tractable, and it goes uh, until we uh, until G quit. And then we have some region where we have uh, FO uh, model checking is fixed parameter tractable. It includes all this bay, so all this bonded twin width part. Uh, classes which have uh, which are uh, transduction of bonded expansion modulo some existence of decomposition and nowhere dense classes, and uh, but maybe it is true also for uh, for what remains uh, for all monadically dependent classes. We don't know. And also, it seems that there is a frontier between this uh, bonded expansion part and nowhere dense part, which might be related to a chromatic notion that I put in. Uh, with some uh, some dots with sky line. And, and we have many conjectures and many question marks in this uh, in this uh, in this drawing. So it shows that uh, the adventure only begins. So thank you for your attention. I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh uh, so uh, we're a bit over time, but we still have time for a few, maybe brief questions. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not. Oh, is there any question? Uh, please raise your hand or. Uh, Uh, well, I, I have a, 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 a question. So, in in, in uh, you mentioned you discussed uh, first order transductions, and uh, 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 but uh, there's also these MSO transductions. Yes. And the the question is, do you think there's any connection between the two fields? And a more uh, specific uh, part of this question is the following: that uh, uh, for uh, objects such as trees and words, but not graphs. Uh, often, if one uses first order logic, one uses first order logic with an order, uh, as opposed to a successor. Yes. So does this make any sense for graphs? So uh, for graph, it means that uh, this is all this region where you, if you use uh, an order, uh, basically you, you will work on ordered graphs and you, uh, it means that monad this monadic independence will be with uh, this classes with bonded twin widths. It means that, uh, uh, basically, with that will be uh, classes which will be uh, uh, manageable. For instance, you can prove that you have, if you have a hereditary class of ordered graphs, then first order logic uh, using this order is uh, FPT under uh, standard assumption if and only if the class has bonded twin widths. Thank you. A any other questions? Uh Well, if, uh, I, I, if I'm not missing anybody, then uh, let's uh, thank uh, Patrice once again for a very nice talk.